Hi, my name is Ryan. I'm here to talk about um, radiation sickness and how I was exposed um, in Japan during the disaster and uh, you know how my life has been since then. Um, before the disaster I lived in Japan for about eight or nine years uh, working in the fashion industry mainly. Um, let's see, the day of the disaster um, Pretty much just thought it was a, a huge earthquake and a giant tsunami had come through Tohoku, but more or less everybody in Tokyo was okay, despite the fact that the um, the aftershocks were quite severe. But seemingly none of the buildings fell down in Tokyo, and there was not much broken there. Basically, on Monday, I got a call from my mom that, um, this was March 14, 2011, that um, three reactors had melted down. That was like, what she was hearing in the press over here in America, in LA. And that I should get out of Japan, or at least Tokyo, immediately. So my wife and I, we uh, quickly got our stuff and we got on a bull train, like within half an hour, and we're out of the city and in Osaka. Um, uh, following three hours after that. Let's see, Osaka, Monday night, nothing happened. On Tuesday night, we decided we wanted to find a better hotel. Um, so we finally found a hotel, and this was a, probably about three o'clock in the afternoon, and it had been a sunny day all day that day. Um, people, it was almost t-shirt weather. However, around 3.30, 4 o'clock, uh, the weather drastically changed. It went from being warm to very cool, uh, clouds rolled in and the wind started blowing pretty hard. Um, there were even snowflakes falling from the sky which kind of made for an odd sight being that everybody was wearing their spring clothes and weren't prepared for this kind of weather. Um, I think it was at that point that I must have breathed in something from the that came from the nuclear plant. Um, I went up, we checked into our hotel room, and within two hours I had pretty extremely severe diarrhea. Very, very painful. I also had um, several bloody noses that went on throughout the night. Um, that very same night, uh, my wife had called her friend who's in the neighboring prefecture to Osaka uh, in a place called Hyogo. And um, my friend had a, our friend I should say, had a, was staying in a family house there. Um, she too had left Tokyo to get away from any kind of impending um, radiation plumes that might surround the city. And uh, she had told us initially, like, if you make it to Osaka, you know, you can just take the train to Hyogo, half an hour or so, and uh, you know, you're welcome to stay at my family's house. We have plenty of rooms. and you know, stay as long as you need to. So, um, when we talked to her, you know, to take her up on her offer, um, we were pretty much um, blown away by the fact that she had us come down with a severe fever, as well as nausea, and was sweating, and was basically rendered incapacitated. She could barely talk on the phone. Um, so because of that we decided not to go to her house in Kyogo. You know, um, looking back on it, it's pretty obvious that myself as well as her um, became sick with some sort of um, radiation type of illness at that point. A few months after the disaster, I started noticing a few changes um, occurring in my body. Um, first, the most noticeable was that the skin on my face became extremely dry and was always peeling. No matter how much water I drank or how much lotion I put on my face, it was always dry and sensitive and peeling. Um, the second thing I noticed was that uh, I started having pretty bad muscle spasms in my legs, um, around my thighs. Um, also, I started noticing a uh, spasm, kind of twitching sensation in um, right under my left rib cage. 
in January 2013 is when um, the real problem started to occur in my body. Um, I started having um, um, diarrhea on a daily basis. Um, anything I ate seemingly upset my stomach. Um, my stomach became extremely bloated. Um, the area around my colon was extremely tender. And um, from January 2013 till June 2013, this just progressively got worse and worse and worse and worse on a daily basis. And let me just say that I was extremely careful with um, what kinds of foods I ate when I was in Japan. I almost ate nothing coming from um, the Tohoku region or even Kanto or even Kansai. I didn't eat anything, almost. Sometimes I'd have to if I was out and I was at a restaurant, you know, I just had to eat something. But, you know, 90% of the time, I only ate food from Kyushu. And even though I did that, I still came down with extremely bad um, GI problems. I came across a news article um, earlier this year about the USS Reagan and the Navy personnel that had been in, on board at the time of the Fukushima disaster, um, you know, they had seemingly come down with radiation sickness as well. Um, their symptoms seemed to really correlate with mine. I was completely blown away. Um, you know, internal bleeding, uh, rectal bleeding, night sweats, jaundice, spasms, uh, loss of memory, um, scabs that won't go away in the nose. So after reading the article on the Navy personnel, um, I decided I had to have a heavy metal analysis done on my hair to determine whether I had cesium, uranium, or strontium in my body. And if, you know, and if I did, if that could be the cause of my illness. When I got the test back, I was completely blown away that I had high levels of uranium of all things. Um, furthermore, I quickly researched whether, you know, uranium miners or soldiers who had been around depleted, depleted uranium um, often came down with bowel diseases such as colitis or Crohn's. And uh, sure enough, uranium affects the bowels and, you know, it's known to cause bowel diseases. To the naysayers out there that might suggest that I have elevated levels of uranium due to um, various hair products or shampoos that I might have used, no way. If you lived 150 miles away from three nuclear meltdowns and you happen to have elevated levels of uranium in your body, that's not a coincidence. Let's look at the extent of the contamination of the Japanese mainland. It's now known that the reactors 1, 2, and 3 at Fukushima Daiichi all melted down and melted through the seal reactor vessels within a few days following the earthquake and tsunami of March 11, 2011. This was not made public by either TEPCO or the Japanese government for two months. The greatest amounts of highly radioactive gases were released shortly after the meltdowns and 80% of this gas released by the actors believed to have traveled away from Japan over the Pacific. However, the remaining 20% was dispersed over the Japanese mainland. On March 11th, the U.S. National Nuclear Security Administration offered the use of its NA-42 aerial measuring system to the Japanese and U.S. governments. The National Atmospheric Release Advisory Center of the Lawrence Livermore Lab stood up to provide atmospheric modeling projections. The next two slides were produced by Lawrence Livermore and were presumably given to the Japanese government. On March 14th, the easterly winds which had been blowing the highly radioactive gases and aerosols coming from Fukushima out to sea shifted and pushed the radioactive plume back over the Japanese mainland. You can see the progression. The, the red uh, indicates the radioactive plume. 
Note that the images indicate that the plume first went south over Tokyo, and then reversed and went north as the wind changed. All the areas where the radioactive gases passed were over were contaminated. However, the heaviest contamination occurred where rainfall uh, where it rained out. And this is, uh, accounts for the patchy deposition of the radioactive fallout. Eight months after the disaster, the Japanese Science Ministry released this map. That's the one with the, let's see, it would be on your right, which shows that 11,580 square miles, which is 30,000 square kilometers, which represents 13% of the Japanese mainland had been contaminated with long-lived radioactive cesium. Note that the official map does not note any cesium-137 contamination in the Tokyo metropolitan area, unlike an unofficial survey uh, done about the same time by Professor Yukio Hayakawa of Gunma University. Given the fact that the Japanese government and TEPCO denied for two months that any meltdowns that had occurred at Fukushima, one must look at all official data with a healthy degree of skepticism. 4,500 square miles, or earlier today we heard 7,700 square miles, uh, which is an area larger than the size of Connecticut, was found to have radiation levels that exceeded Japan's previously allowable exposure rate of one millisievert per year. Rather than evacuate this area, Japan chose to raise its acceptable radiation exposure rate by 20 times, from one millisievert to 20 millisieverts per year. However, approximately 300 square miles adjacent to the destroyed Fukushima reactors were so contaminated that they were declared uninhabitable. 159,000 Japanese were evicted from this radioactive exclusion zone, lost their homes, property, and businesses, and most have received only a small compensation to cover the costs of their living as evacuees. I hope I've made it clear that long-lived radionuclides produced by nuclear power plants are neither safe nor clean. What suggests that it is a very bad idea to manufacture these nuclear poisons to try to make electricity, that it's past time we stop manufacturing them and try to manage those which we have already created, which must be isolated from the ecosystems for at least 100,000 years.